much and uh, good morning to uh, all of the attendees to the uh, book launch by Dr. Ali Chikte on the teacher's right to strike. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Petelia. I'm a consultant to CDH and also a practitioner in labor dispute resolution, particular in mediation facilitation. Um, and I think just as a starting point, you know, it's to welcome Dr. Chikte who's taken the opportunity to share with us some of his thoughts uh, from the book that he has uh, just recently uh, launched uh, with Juta. And uh, it's a wonderful opportunity, I think, uh, to be talking about a subject uh, in respect of where we require a lot more thought leadership. And this thought leadership is something that uh, CDH has taken quite seriously in terms of igniting a lot more thinking around areas, especially in employment law. Uh, and when it comes to collective labor law, I think we have levels of frustration with uh, the practice of collective labor law. So it is a wonderful opportunity just to be sharing thoughts. And with us as well from CDH is uh, Fiona Lepin, uh, who is a director as well. And we'll be forming a panel to talk through not only the book, its lessons, but also what can be done uh, potentially from a thinking perspective, but more so from an implementation perspective. And so um, CDH has been quite kind uh, with Juta as the publisher of this particular book and WITS Law School. And WITS itself has been celebrating its 100th year, 100th year anniversary. So this is a quite a concerted effort to bring together different components, uh, which is also quite a wonderful initiative to ensure that we get academics, uh, we get publishers and we get practitioners together to start talking about these particular concepts. So welcome to the session. I think it's um, of course going to be a one hour session. We're going to try and keep it quite interesting, but to ensure that it is as participative as possible, we encourage you as participants, please, to share your thoughts. Um, and, and, and really those are quite important as well in the chat. If you've got any particular questions, feel free to put them in the chat as well. We'll be monitoring the chat at different points and we'll be sure to pick up on your important lessons because I see we've got a multitude of attendees from different areas of not only practice, but private sector and public sector. So welcome. I hope you're going to be enjoying the session. And uh, Ali, just to kick off, um, I'm calling him Ali, but he is a doctor, of course, and I think I should be introducing him a little bit more. Dr. Chikte is and has been an academic for I think many, many years. I know him, he was, we studied together at university, but he's remained there at Wits University for now probably about 25 years or so, Dr. Chikte. But not only as an academic, uh, he is also a practitioner in the field of dispute resolution, has sit uh, uh, as the chairperson of the company's tribunal. He also is a panel man member of uh, CSOs um, and different organizations that uh, are really keen to have his uh, skill. Uh, but where we do also sit together is lecturing in the Labor Dispute Resolution Program at the Mandela Institute, and we've been doing quite a bit of work in developing mediation and negotiation skills amongst LLB students over the years. Welcome, Dr. Chikte. Uh, we're very grateful for the time and the opportunity to be talking to you today. Um, I think just to kick off, uh, why this topic? Uh, thank you, Ibrahim, and uh, thanks. Uh... CDH uh, for hosting and for partnering with WITS and, and Juta uh, for the book um, launch. Um, look, it's, it's an important topic for me uh, when deciding on, on what to write on. Um, the right to education. I mean, if you look back to the 1950s, um, when Bantu education was introduced in South Africa by the National Party and by, uh, there's an important speech made by Hendrik Verwoerd uh, when he talks about the introduction of Bantu education, it was introduced primarily not to educate the black community to an extent as the white community were, were educated. The idea was to create a working class merely to provide uh, for the industries that the apartheid government wanted, the mining industries and others that were developing. Uh, 
And I think we often forget our history because it's, it's important to understand if you're going to limit education, if you're going to ensure that a community is not educated to its full capacity, I'm not sure what can be more cruel. Uh, you're basically creating a slave state. Uh, and and, and, and that's, that's one aspect, the right to education uh, is an extremely important right. But on the other hand, the right to protest uh, for teachers is an important one. I mean, if you look at our history, and uh, again, if you look back to the 1948, when the National Party came into power, uh, before the teachers would go on strike, not much, but they, they would a bit. But when, when the National Party came into power, uh, a, a number of legislation were passed in order to hinder any form of protest. Uh, you had uh, anti-communist legislation, uh, ANC, PAC were banned, um, group immorality, uh, group areas legislation. Uh, you had a clamp down on any form of protest. And, and if you think about teachers, uh, as, as black South Africans, uh, very few became lawyers and doctors because universities were restricted in who they could accept. Uh, so the avenue to, to education became teachers, nursing. And those teachers uh, in the 1950s who protested against any form of uh, state oppression, uh, and were affiliated with, uh, with with the liberation movement were arrested. It was only from 1976 onwards that uh, we saw uh, an emergence of, uh, of 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 conflict uh, of 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 uh, organized labor once again. So not as organized as we see it today. Uh, 1980s, uh, a number of protests, number of teacher unions, smaller unions were being established. Uh, Kosatu was established at the time. And in the 1980s, we saw a downfall of uh, the apartheid uh, state, uh, primarily because of economic reasons. 1990 is an important period, uh, Ibrahim, for, for South African history and globally. I mean, the end of the Cold War was important for South Africa. I think if the Cold War never ended, we'd probably still be under apartheid. Uh, the apartheid government played an important role uh, for the West in South Africa, and we don't often see it that way, but uh, the, the the fight against communism in, in, in Angola and, um, Moz and Mozambique uh, prevented the spread of communism in the, in, in the South. And, and it's only once the Cold War came to an end that the negotiations spiraled and we, we, where we were able to get a negotiated settlement in 94. So in 1994, we had this dilemma. You had, I mean, in 1990, you had the formation of Satu, who saw themselves as unions. And Naptosa, uh, uh, the, the, the whole professional debate amongst teachers and professionalism versus trade unionism. But I think the debate is now is now died down a bit. So in 1994, when the new constitution was adopted, when we had the right to strike and the right to education, two extremely important rights: the right to education, uh, the, 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 I mean, to, to remove Bantu education and to ensure that everyone has equal access to education is extremely critical. Uh, and it was a fundamental, a fundamental right. And at the same time, you needed to balance it with the right to strike. It's important that employees be allowed to strike to, ch to challenge the oppression of the state, whether it's an apartheid state or whether it's a democratic state. Uh, it's important we're able to do that. Now, what this book tries to do, it takes into account those two very fundamental rights and also the right to comply with international law. Uh, before 94, we were a pariah state. Uh, labor courts would apply ILO standards to the unfair labor practice to the, to the, to the students. Um, but after 94, we became bound and we, we, we took on a number of treaties, the right to organize and the right to collective bargaining work specifically. And those have been interpreted to provide employees with the right to strike, uh, including teachers. So this book tries to balance the right to strike and the right to education in a compliance with international labor standards. Uh, it has a number of interesting chapters. The first chapter, uh, other than the introductory chapter, talks about why it's important to strike and tries to negate some of the arguments that are made against strikes. Arguments, uh, the first one was whether teachers are professionals or, or unions. Uh, there's a whole argument about teachers are professionals, professionals don't strike. But you can be a professional and you can be an employee. As long as you work for someone, there could be room for exploitation, and you should be allowed to collectively challenge that. And, and I think that debate has now died down. I think the Tosa initially saw themselves as professionals, but as you're facing a state uh, that that mindset uh, changes, 
and 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 you see a number of strikes by both uh, Satu, Natosa, and the other teacher unions themselves. And a number of other arguments. One of the main arguments is whether we why not use arbitration instead of going on strike. You know, other countries are doing it, but we're not other countries. We're not Canada. You know, we're not other first world countries. We come. I mean, interest based arbitration is very different from rights based arbitration. Rights based, it's easy. You see where the right is violated, and the courts can deal with. Interest based, you've got to think about what type of values you're going to look at to make a decision. Are you looking at market value? Are you looking at power? Remember, in South Africa, it's also inequality. It's one of the most unequal societies in the world. Is an arbitrator going to look at inequalities? You know, how are we going to create an equal society when people have been left so far behind? Um, so it looks at that debate. Uh, it also looks at uh, um, a number of other uh, debates uh, regarding uh, the importance of the right to strike. Uh, whether the right to strike is a first generation right, second generation right. That's a, a debate that people have been having as well. But I think the right to strike is important for all other rights in our constitution. If you are, if your rights are violated as an employee, it violates your right to dignity. It violates your right to life. You know, your quality of life is impacted upon if you if you're not paid significantly. Uh, your rights to property. You know, how does strike relate to property? You may ask. I mean, you own your body in a sense. You know, you're allowed to strike and, and then use your body in that sense. So there's a whole debate about, it deals with a number of different uh, different arguments. Um, it looks at strikes in the public sector versus private sector. It looks at the history of teacher strikes in South Africa. Uh, and also it talks about the fact that prohibiting strikes, that the laws are ineffective. In a country like South Africa, where we're able to protest against state oppression, the laws are not going to stop us from striking if there's going to be any form of oppression. Uh, so it looks at those debates, and then it also looks at why we should comply with international labor organization standards. And ILO standards on strikes are interesting, because the two main conventions, Convention 98 and 87, do not mention the right to strike. No way is it mentioned in those conventions that employers have a right to strike. The ILO Committee of Experts and the ILO Committee on Freedom of Association have interpreted sections in those conventions uh, to imply that we have a right to strike. Right? The right to strike is important as an association. Without strikes, your powers collectively don't make sense. There's no point not using your collective power. But what's interesting is that in 2012, employers walked out of the ILO. They said, look, we never signed on to this. We never agreed that these two conventions mean that we have a right to strike. Um, and then in 2015, there was some form of truce between the employers and the unions, but it's still somewhat on shaky ground. I mean, that those conventions don't mention it, uh, but we got years of jurisprudence from the ILO committees of experts and freedom of association on the right to strike. So it's important. So those first two chapters look at the importance of the right to strike and the importance of the right to comply with ILO standards, because there's a whole lot of debate about whether we should be complying with international law as well. Does it violate your right to sovereignty? Uh, but we have a constitutional obligation to comply with international law. Our LRA also says you must interpret the act in accordance with international law. And then the rest of the book um, deals with uh, strikes, uh, various areas of strike in quite detail. Um, the definition of strike. Um, what's interesting about the definition of strikes, if you look at the definition in the LRA, it talks about not just a complete stoppage, but a partial stoppage. Retardation, obstruction. Now, the question we've also got to ask ourselves is do we need the same laws for all industries? Do you want teachers to be obstructing other teachers when it, in schools? Do you want teachers to be going on go slows? I don't know. I mean, that's just an interesting I, a thought. I mean, should all industries be having the same laws applied to them? Uh, you don't want a teacher stopping another teacher from teaching in a class. Uh, or, or from going on a go slow. Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe that's something to think about. So the definition of strikes is a, is, a, is an important one. Uh, strike procedures it looks at that as well. Although there's, there's nothing much on uh, strike procedures that uh, the, the main issue was a secret ballot. I think it's an interesting one. What international law says about it. International law does it leaves it to the discretion of the state. And in South Africa, there's a whole lot of debate whether you should have a ballot, whether that should make the strike unprotected. 
With the new amendments, it's not unprotected. It's just an internal process between the union and, the, and their members. Uh, I mean, there's arguments for and against ballots. The one for it is say, don't go on strike if majority of the members don't support it. The counter argument is that how are they going to do it in time? It's, 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 it's maybe practically difficult to, to actually conduct a ballot. Uh, and then with circumstances where strikes are prohibited, important question we always ask ourselves is whether teachers are essential services. Now, I think with lockdown, I mean, our notion of essential services when you are in the virus somehow changed. All of a sudden, supermarket workers were essential in accordance with the, not in accordance with the LRA, but in accordance with the emergency legislation. You know, education became important as well. People who could afford it would do it online. Uh, most of our schools don't have those facilities. Some of them were having smaller classes. Some day kids going to one day, and other, other kids going other days. So what we see as essential in society, somehow things we, the matter of life and death and, and, and our future. I don't know if, we, if we've looked at things differently uh, because of the lockdown. I mean, I mean, the fact that we play our, our sports people more than we pay our teachers, um, I think it's, it's, it says a lot about our society. We're more worried about our own personal entertainment. We're concerned about our kids' education, but we're not necessarily willing to pay the price for that. So, so that's something we, we, we should hopefully look at as a, as, a, as a community with regard to uh, essential service is an interesting debate when it comes to teachers. Uh, because a lot of people have argued, are teachers essential services or not? According to the ILO, they're not essential services. Essential services, the definition itself is subject to interpretation. You know, it's an it's a interruption of which should endanger the life, personal safety or health. What's life? What's personal safety? What's health? I mean, must it be imminent? You know, the, the, the ESCOM load shedding shows that it's not necessarily imminent if electricity is gone for a day or two, but but it's still something that's that's an essential service. Uh, what's interesting about the ILO is that even though teachers are not essential services, they allowed certain countries to enter into minimum service agreements with teachers. Now, and that's something I talk about in the book. Should we have a minimum service agreement in the education sector? Remember, our education sector is not all the same. Private schools have different facilities. Rural schools, public schools have different facilities. A strike may be, have a greater impact on some schools than, it, than in other schools. You know, so, so I'm going to look into that in, in a bit more detail. Maybe one should have a minimum service agreement with teachers participating in the process. The fact that we have strikes, and I mean, so I mean that's an important debate. What's a minimum service agreement? Who should be formed part of the minimum service agreement? Should it be all teachers? Should it be all schools? Should it be only teachers in the final year of schooling who are finishing their matric? Um, should it be in the timing of the year as well, at the end of the year, or beginning of the year? Maybe we should also change the timing of our negotiations. Remember, we're gonna be facing a strike now when students are writing a matric exam. So. Uh, and, and also it's the most poorest communities that suffer the most, you know. And, and I think also this whole debate about whether how teacher strikes affect education. The truth is there isn't any real data to show that the teacher strike will impact on the child's education. You know, there isn't any real data to, to, to show that. How do you actually show that if teachers went on strike on so many days, a kid would do worse in their magic exams in so many days. So that's 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 another thing. One's got to look at. Uh, so the whole debate about teachers and essential service, I think we need to balance the right to strike and the right to education in compliance with international law. I think we can do that if we have a reasonable uh, minimum service agreement, if we have one, but we must take into account that all schools are not the same. We also need to take into account that children are doing poorly in school, not because of teacher strikes, but because of socioeconomic reasons. You know, a lot of, in a lot of communities, parents are working, kids are at home. A lot of kids may live in areas where violence is thrived. Their schooling is poorly facilitated. I mean, how much do we have our budget we actually give to schooling in this country? I mean, this last budget was 3%. 3% to rectify Bantu education to ensure that our future of the children are... Uh, I mean, uh, it's not only about teacher salaries. I mean, we have such to also complain about facilities, infrastructure, poor schools, uh, uh, because they lack those things. Uh, so. And, and I think maybe we don't give enough attention to, to education as we should be, and we don't put enough of our budget in that. Uh, 
Um, no, I, mean, I don't know if I'm talking too much, Ibrahim. No, no, no. Me. I think it's fascinating because it raises uh, a combination of issues. And I think why, for me in particular, this topic uh, is quite relevant is on the areas that you've touched. Is that firstly is that I think we tend to forget the history. Where, do our, where does our law come from? Where do, where do these organisations come from? Even from a perspective of collective bargaining, from an ILO perspective, what is the essential ingredients required to ensure that there is effective collective bargaining? And do we have that? Has that been nurtured? For example, you know, self-organisation. Are unions and employers able to self-organise effectively? Um, is there a very human-centered approach. And these are things that the ILO speak about. But of course, within the context of South Africa, I think it's a peculiar reality that we face with the levels of inequality, the history. And strikes have a very different meaning, if I, you know, if I get you uh, quite clearly in, in certain contexts. I think that's that history is particularly useful. But of course, where we at it then at the moment is that there's policy choices made as a consequence of perhaps uh, you know the after post 94 and that balance is quite important to strike because you've got uh, sorry the, yes the balance is important to strike no pun intended between the right to, to strike and of course education which is an interesting area because education itself hits home quite clearly and there's knock-on effects but also health sectors and other sectors that are quite important um ali then you've also you know you've touched on what is of course an important debate as to whether there is uh, too much given to the right to strike in balancing the powers, but also in resolving disputes. And should you be looking at alternatives like mutual interest arbitration? And what has been, of course, a quite an important topic, I think, and not only you've raised it, but of course it's been at the ELD, the Employment Law Department of CDH. They had they hosted a, co a conference last week and uh, the Essential Services Commission's chairperson also raised this. It's quite interesting that they've actually, um, I think they've got a, since the takeover by the new chairperson was about 300 or so, um, is a minimum service agreements have, have gone through. So there is a great uptick. But I'm quite interested now, just for a moment, Fiona, from your side, if you could join us. Um, because Fiona, of course, you've, from a practice perspective, you obviously, dealing with uh, quite important industries, maybe beyond just the public sector, is it in the private sector? And you, your career has uh, traversed a whole range of important industries, and you've, you've w walked the path with a lot of your clients in respect of some of the changes that Ali talks about. So some interesting debates, but I'm quite keen to understand, is there a linkage between what we find is findings in perhaps the public sector, the debates that arise, and its influence in the private sector, and what are some of the lessons from your side? And perhaps, you know, you may disagree with some of the aspects of Ali. I'm always one for a bit of conflict. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, as, a, as a starting point, uh, I found the book fascinating because for me it went way beyond just the public sector uh, and teachers in particular. I thought it was a, a really insightful expose as to our law as it has progressed, bearing in mind that very often our disadvantaged members of society have actually garnered their rights in the employment space. And it's so important to always remember what happens out there in communities, in our broader society, is invariably um, replicated in the workplace and workplace relations. And I think the, the, the book did a lot to, to show up that, that particular significance of those rights that have been won. And in difficult economic circumstances, it's demonstrating how difficult it is for an employer to move away from those hard-won rights, to try and change them, even rebase conditions of employment, because the, the employees are saying, you are touching on something that's been fundamental to our development as trade unions um, and our relationship with our unions and then with our employers over the years that we don't want that to be tampered with because you're taking us back to a place we don't want to go. Um, firstly, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed understanding the take on pre-strike procedures, 
the, the, the enormous, uh, I would say, uh, emphasis that has to be placed on trying to negotiate to get to the deal, to try to avoid the industrial action where it's possible, because it should be the last resort when the parties have just not been able to reach traction. I think it's a, a very valuable uh, message that we would have read on the wires since Friday, where Sabanya has reached a significant five year wage agreement with AMCU uh, without the need for any third party intervention. They've managed to do it themselves. And, and that was it, uh, I think, um, it, it's useful to see that there were there were agreements reached with other unions first, with the NUM, with with WASA, etc., and AMCU was lagging a bit behind. But how the parties managed to get that maturity to actually work together and to reach a deal, and in a huge industry like that, where you're talking forty thousand odd employees impacted by a deal of that nature. It shows that it can be done and it's 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 I think been the combination of what some of our courts have expected of employers when they are in deadlock with employees over conditions of employment, mutual interest issues. Uh, it's the the primary consideration is can you get to yes on your own? Uh, and I think that's where yeah. Brian, I'm talking to the converted with your good self because you put such an enormous uh, emphasis on that. But we shouldn't be uh, naive um, because one thing that, that, that uh, has always caught my imagination in pre-strike procedures is the final notification to strike and how you get to that point. Because if you're going into the conciliatory mechanisms as you do, uh, either run by a bargaining council or of course the CCMA, uh, you don't want to be faced with a commissioner who says, well, can you settle yes or no, ticks the, the strike box on the certificate of non-resolution of the dispute, and 48 hours later, you're, on, you're faced with the industrial action. And unions in the past have been, they've been a little crafty because sometimes in comes that notification on a Friday afternoon late, and the strike is going to start on Monday morning. And, and, and it, it's certainly placing an emphasis on the party's ability to engage, and there must be trust there. And I think that that's been a, a very interesting debate, which the book uh, certainly explores, is the extent to which is there a duty uh, to bargain in good faith. Our new code of good practice, which is balancing industrial action and picketing rules, etc., is an attempt to get to those fundamentals. But as Dr. Chikke is as pointed out in his book, uh, if that is not complied with, what are the repercussions? What, what lies uh, at the heart of what the employer can or cannot do to manage that? particular problem because it's some people argue well that code of good practice doesn't have teeth. I think it has to be seen in its proper context is trying to up that maturity that hopefully employers and unions can achieve and I've just now given you an example of, of, of an employer that's managed that with a major trade union. Uh, and maybe I'm talking too much because I've got lots more to say because <laughs> this no, leads no, no. into one of the issues I know that you've explored with me, and you might want to just um, say a little before I do, which is one of the big problems we have is violence in strike action, and how do we manage that? No, I, I think you've touched the nail on the head in that there's a lot of good examples of the policy choices working simply because of the party's level of maturity. It's what they put in, in to the quality of their own negotiations, the building of trust, and a whole range of other things that uh, actually the law emphasizes that they need to take responsibility on. And the code of good practice is simply a reminder. It's a very important reminder of what should have been in place. So while you have a fundamental right to strike, there's this fundamental responsibility. And we've seen it in its worst forms when it goes wrong. It's the extent of violence in strikes. And unfortunately, that's probably why there's so much jurisprudence in the area of strikes, because uh, often you've got to go before the Labour Court and say, well, help, 
and the interdicts are not easy to come by, but uh, they certainly uh, excite a lot more legal debate in areas that perhaps does not emphasize responsibility, but rather consequence management, Fiona. Yes, um, I, I thought it was very useful going back to a passage from the recent case and Dr. Chikid, sorry, Dr. Chikte actually makes mention of this in, in, in his book, and that's the decision of AMCU and Anglo Gold Ashanti Limited on sympathy strikes, in which our firm played a very major role, firstly because we'd acted for, for Longman Platinum during the course of that uh, uh, protracted litigation, but when it became Sabania that we were acting on its behalf. Um, but one thing that uh, Judge Pillay mentions, and this was 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 a certainly a key note in in her majority decision, was that once strikes cease to be peaceful, she says stridently as this, they lose the protection of the law. Now, admittedly, that is in the context of a secondary strike, where of course the court has the opportunity to explore the reasonableness of that secondary strike action and the point of the constitutional court decision to say a proportionality test is applicable. You measure the impact of that secondary strike, not only on the primary employer, but also the secondary employer. And the factors that you take into account to assess that reasonableness is conduct of strikers and violent behavior. But she had a caveat to that, which I think leads into just your very point, Ibrahim, that if there's the opportunity to bring an interdict to stop the violence, that that is a preferred route than always going to challenge the protected nature of the industrial action. But of course, that can be cold comfort for employers because one only has to assess the attitude of the union, Sasau and Oak Valley estates when faced with uh, certainly a deteriorating situation and violence at the very outset of a strike, that trade union said, well, we deny our members are involved. It's members of the community and we've got no control over them. Now, employers have to become creative in that space and trade unions, as you suggest, Ryan, must take responsibility. It's no good to say it's not a problem. It's not our problem. It's community members. Well, if you don't know who those community members are and you're not coming forward to assist the employer in that regard, then how can you say it's not your members who are participating in that type of rank? Uh, misconduct. And it's it's not easy for an employer to um, control behaviour of persons it can't identify. Uh, and I think that that's bringing into to great um, focus. The strike is on, but you've got this level of tension that uh, is impeding the collective bargaining and the opportunity for proper negotiation because you've got people who are behaving outside of the parameters of the law. I just want to take uh, Dr. Chikte's uh, you know, view on this uh, for a moment because of course you know there is a great merit in tracking back the history and of course there's, there's sound reason in having these policy choices and we understand that but when it when it falls apart because the parties uh, are not behaving in the way that was anticipated from their responsibility. What do we do? And uh, I mean, that's my question to you. I call you Ali. It's very strange to call you doctor. Yeah, it's you know, it me. gives you Thanks. such a status. Yeah. <laughs> I feel so <laughs> underwhelmed. <I'm> <laughs> but uh, Ali, yes, um, I mean, what's your view or, or generally and what Fiona has shared? Um, look, I think we talk about strike violence and sometimes those two words become so synonymous with one another, which, which is unfortunate because I think South Africa itself is plagued with violence, you know, not just not just the labor sector. The, our entire lives are surrounded by violence I and mean, the extent of crime, uh, the way we live in our homes, uh, we're basically prisoners uh, to some extent. Um, uh, so violence is, is part of our our history. I mean, maybe people only listen when when, when we use violence uh, in, in South Africa, you know, to challenge the state. People had to use violence, but eventually, wanted to come and sit on the table and negotiate and get a peaceful resolution. So, when it comes to violence, uh, I suppose there's a whole lot of things uh, apart from the law that needs to be rectified. Uh, as I said, the socio-economic uh, uh, 
uh, status of, of communities, a more equal society, uh, greater access to 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 uh, to services, uh, a decline in corruption by the state. Um, and I think all those things play a role. It doesn't mean uh, we, we've got to be violent because we don't have anything, but, but, but maybe that, that, that may help to some extent. The inequality, it's not just the poverty, I think the inequality and, uh, that, that we have. When it comes to the law on, 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 on violence, I think the book uh, compares a number of different theories. Uh, I mean, there's two theories uh, by Alan Rycroft. Uh, well, he argues that if it becomes a uh, strike, becomes violent, it's not functional and should be unprotected. And then there's a counter argument made um, which says that uh, what level of violence must a strike be to become non-functional. Uh, so you, you can't use strike violence as, as a reason for, for making the strike unprotected. Uh, it, it will leave the strike open to, to outside influences who may instigate violence, whether it's the employer, whether it's third parties. Uh, so violence in, in itself does not make a strike unprotected. Um, if there is violence, uh, it seems as though there is enough law to deal with uh, with the violence and to deal with uh, misconduct. And that's what I argue in the book. I mean, there are interdicts, there are dismissals. You can sue the union uh, for, for liability. I'm not sure why the employers are not doing that. The one argument Fiona is saying is that they don't always identify the people. But even when they do identify people, are they taking action or is it easier to just say, hey, look, let's go back to work uh, and uh, let's continue? Because I think that sends in, in a wrong signal to uh, to the employers who are committing the violence, to, to those employers who don't want violence in their workplace as well. Uh, so I think they also need to be protected. Uh, so I think the law that we have needs to be enforced in order to ensure that strike violence is dealt with. The police also need to be a bit more vigilant. Uh, I think they're a bit more hesitant after Marikana. Uh, but there's got to be some balance. The law needs to be enforced, uh, and and people who commit violence need to be uh, need to need to need to have the law being enforced on them. I'm not sure if the employer should be. If the employer doesn't take any action against uh, employees who commit violence. Maybe this is a question for Fiona. Should action be taken against the employer for failing to protect other employees, for failing to take action, uh, and that would force them to take action whether the employer is the state or whether the employer is a, is a private sector, to force them to take action when violence is committed because they're not protecting the public and they're not protecting fellow employees. So I think, if I may, um, Ali, you've raised something very, very close to our hearts, which is there are certain opportunities available to the employers that employers might not be utilising effectively. And one of those is to take this, the picketing rules and really use that as the opportunity, not just to set the, the code of conduct during the strike or the industrial action, but also what happens when that doesn't take place. In other words, you want also to have your union come along with you and be taking steps in order to bring its errant members to heel. And it must take that responsibility because if they don't, they face a number of quite severe consequences, which employers might not have been that active to pursue, such as um, compensatory orders, as you raise in your book, against a union because it is allowed conduct in furtherance of the strike to simply break the parameters of what's lawful behaviour and what is not that the employer has the opportunity and we uh, had colleagues in our firm who were successful in this regard in having picketing rules cancelled where they were breached so materially and to the point where the strike just was not manageable and that was in of course the retail outlets of a major pharmaceutical company so there are those options but i think sometimes they're not well explored and you raise an important issue this when the the strike is done then is there a follow-through in terms of bringing such a compensatory order or are you going to be a strident employer and we've seen it in the mining sector where the strike is a protected strike but they take disciplinary action where the, the picketing rules are breached. And that was taking place during the strike itself, because one wants to get away from the notion that one can't take discipline during the course of the strike. Yes, you can, and so you should. And, and I think those are the parameters that one can explore in looking at picketing rules. And it, I think it's heartening 
from the legislative changes, the code of good practice, it's a very positive, uh, I think, step that the, the strike shouldn't happen unless the picketing rules are in place, because it's sending a clear message that we need a better standard of conduct for strikes to, to, to meet out their, their, their full potential and bring the employer to heel in terms of what the demands uh, are. And I always go back to Ford Dagenham all those years ago, at its plant in the United Kingdom. Yes, it was the women who were on strike for better pay, but what was so crucial about that strike is it brought that company and its production line to its knees, but there was no act of violence. It was a, a, it noted as an exceptionally peaceful strike. There was a down tooling and these ladies were uh, fundamental on the production line because they were doing the stitching on, on, on the seats, which are a major component of the vehicle. And their strike was hugely successful because uh, it pushed the employer to, to capitulate. OK, great. Thanks, Fiona. Um, I see in the chat and please, if there's any questions, please feel free to um, to raise them in the chat. Um, but there's comments, of course, from Laurie Warwick. Hi, Laurie, from the CCMA. And I also see we've got uh, the General Secretary of the PSCBC also uh, on this uh, on, on this uh, conference, uh, but Laurie, of course, is raising that the CCMA, I think, grapples with this probably the most because, of course, they take a lot of the responsibility uh, in terms of where things go wrong. They intervene, and we've seen this in a number of instances, even with re recently the Transnet strike. And uh, it's it's a responsibility that they cannot defer. But it's interesting that she's noting that there's a bit of work uh, already been done on interest arbitration and what they're doing is considering adapting that for unions and employers. And, and that's, of course, the CCMA itself, you know, being quite proactive. And then uh, furthermore, uh, opportunities for relationship building by objectives and going back to some of the trust. I, I must say that these are very, very good initiatives, but, you know, in, as a and I know there's always a but, and it's a horrible thing. We taught never to say but because it almost dismisses what Laurie has just said. I would say and where we have initiated this, it seems that the parties themselves in some environments have gone through this dance so many times that they will act, react, go through a strike process, maybe go through a relationship building process and even training and capacity building. And uh, one instance, uh, I was involved in the civil engineering industry a few years ago. We did probably work for about a year in advance with the parties. And what's interesting, they came back and repeated the same behavior and conduct prior to that. And I, I sit back as a facilitator sometimes and ask myself the question, is this really working? And I know that's a very uh, defeatist attitude towards these things, but it, it makes me question because, you know, it's not... What I've come to realize, perhaps it's a lot less about law and policy changes and more about, well, are they really interested in wanting to change and to practice differently? And should we be, as you perhaps suggesting, bring out the stick now and say, well, hold on, you, you, can't, you can't do this right. There will be consequences. So initiatives are great. And I know Fiona as well, I've worked with you on a number of projects. You know, you, know, you don't take the approach let's just say, well, let's just litigate on these matters. Let's build a relationship because even if you are the employer, you're not interested in damaging what has taken quite a while to build. Yeah. Any thoughts on this um, from either of you? So um, is there opportunities okay. still I mean, uh, to, and I know we've taken you from more the strikes uh, in, in, in the public sector, in particular education, but, uh, you know, what, what we're grappling with is there opportunities to really develop and safeguard what are these policy choices and imperatives, or is there a need, need for rethink on policy? And you debate this to some extent. Yeah, look, I think uh, the CCMA, I mean, should be commended for the work they do. Um, I mean, to, to, to try and resolve this at, at, at that level continuously and uh, uh, to run it at ever decreasing budgets is, is, is something that should, that should be commended. Uh, without them, I think we'd be having probably more conflicts and, 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 and than we do. And from the CCMA, a lot of the mediators and conflict resolution experts that we have today have, have developed and 
and that that's commendable. So I think there's always there's always a need for uh, dispute resolution mechanisms to come into play before strikes, and uh, and I do mention that because, um, I mean, strikes are not easy uh, for for employees to partake in. You know, one may always look at the effect of strikes on the public, and that, but what effect does it have on the community? What effect does it have on its family? And often the people who are going strike may not necessarily be wealthy people. They live on a paycheck to paycheck, month to month. And those members every month uh, have, have bills to pay, school fees to pay, uh, etc. So, so anything that can be assist in avoiding those strikes, but taking, but but in the same breath, trying to prevent any form of exploitation, because you could avoid a strike by just preventing people from striking. But a meaningful facilitation process that takes into account uh, the interests of both sides uh, is something that's always welcome. And uh, and I think the work. Uh, that you do, Ibrahim, and that the CCMA does to try and promote these processes. Um, and I think these are behind the scenes things. I mean, we only see the strikes, but the amount of work that happens behind the scenes to prevent those strikes, we don't see. And those are the unsung heroes of that that, that often not mentioned and they carry on trying to resolve those disputes. Uh, so yeah, those are those are always welcome and I think needs to be increased you know, in the public and private sector. There is a question uh, in the chat. I'm grateful for that as well. Let's just uh, hopefully open that up and maybe that will encourage maybe some other thinking. I'm just waiting for my computer to really bring out the chat. Um, but of course, uh, so yeah, uh, Laurie, Laurie, you get the prize for the most amount of chats on this uh, conference. So <laughs> thank you for that. What impact, Dr. Chikte, do you think a proliferation of trade unions in the sector may have on the duration intensity of the strike? Okay, so if we increase the number of unions, what what impact will it have on the intensity of strikes? I think the problem we're having at the moment uh, is that unions are not as unified as they should be. Instead of it's not about the number of unions, whether they work together for a common purpose. I mean, if you look at the law over the number of last few years over organizational rights in particular, the arguments of majoritarianism uh, and the book talks about that. I mean, if you get a majority, you want to exclude others, you want to dominate it, you want to deny other unions organizational rights. And there's a case of the case going to the constitutional court and the number of ample judgments, pop through judgments. Um, uh, ex you know, it's in the idea of majoritarianism is in the, I mean, versus uh, having a number of unions, an important one. And I don't know, I do think the unions need to refocus and need to come together. Otherwise, it's, if you have too many unions, it's like it's like divide and rule for the employer, I think. Work together and try and function together. You're not there to exclude other, other unions from the workplace. Um, and there needs to be some serious thinking of unions to come together. Uh, I also think the traditional unions that we had from 94 and those affiliated, with the ANC to some extent, um, maybe they got isolated in the last few years and, and, and newer unions were established, were much more militant, uh, were able to gain more me uh, members, were able to uh, challenge the, the traditional unions. And uh, maybe since the end of the lockdown, and it's time to, to, to refocus unions. And let's not talk about it, whether it's one union or 50 unions. If you're working together, you're working together. You know, a stronger union, if you have more numbers working together, you can challenge the employer in, 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 in a better way, I think. Uh, it just makes sense for them to come together. And maybe there's a bit of working together, rethinking on the part of the unions to, to say, look, we together we can challenge the employer more rather than the employer picking one over the other. You know? Yeah, thanks. There's uh, perhaps Fiona for you uh, in the chat. What has happened to workplace forums? Are they still fulfilling the intended objectives? And resolving workplace disputes. I always find this to be quite fascinating that it it's still retained. And I, I, I would imagine you'd give us a bit better perspective from perhaps the private sector. But what I, what I find interesting is that we we have uh, and I, perhaps interesting but also frustrating is that the there's a complete exertion uh, by both sides uh, from trade unions and employers on collective bargaining and in particular around what your wage increase would be. Whereas the spectrum of, uh, you know, what we say social dialogue, even intended within the ILO context, uh, is much more wider. And the potential for that is really to encourage a greater emphasis on production, worker rights, worker participation, the like. 
what's your uh, experience, Fiona, from a you know from a, a much broader approach, whether it's workplace forums or consultative forums, joint committees, whatever you call it? So there are sectors where you will find um, statutory fora that have developed, which are operating very well, and I. I'd go to the mining charter and the whole concept of the future forum. And its aim is to tackle the possibility of uh, large scale restructuring, even to the point of closure of an operation. Um, and, and if that is anticipated that long before any section 189.3 notice is issued under, under the Labour Relations Act, the parties have been gauging on these topics and how to deal with it. And, and, and I see the benefit of that simply because uh, there's creative opportunities at stake to manage the downgrading in, 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 in jobs, so, or at least certainly the, the drop off in jobs where the economic circumstances so dictate. We saw that in 2008 with the uh, economic meltdown that was experienced there and something that is South Africa is lauded for are some of the very unique uh, processes it put in place to handle that and that was driven by the CCMA and 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 it was the training development schemes to try and utilize monies available for the um, for those initiatives so that when the economic circumstances uh, were, were better, that persons could come back into the workplace at a much higher skill. I found that a very uh, interesting phase in, in, in our history. And I think we're seeing it again post COVID. And I think that what uh, Ali has mentioned to us is at some point, even in relation to strikes, You've got the the difficulties that you're faced with if the employer doesn't take steps in dealing with these these issues of conduct that it can be sued. What steps did it take to ensure that uh, this type of behavior ameliorated? Now, what is the issue there? It's health and safety. We know that um, under our, our Mine Health and Safety Act, even the Occupational Health and Safety Act, we have these fora that are dealing with I'd say critical issues of safety in the workplace uh, and bringing that to the fore and certainly and risk assessments and the like. And it's those structures we need to build on, I think, because it creates the dialogue. And it creates the level of maturity in the relationship. The workplace forum scenario under the Labour Relations Act hasn't always found traction. Uh, I think that was a because I do think it has enormous potential on a much broader level. And I think these other examples I've cited can demonstrate just how it can work if the parties are committed to that. But it does take a mindset change and also the move away from traditional bargaining about wages and conditions of employment into much more focused areas, privacy, access to information. When you are going into the collective bargaining arena, and um, Ali will know something quite close to my heart. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, th well, thank you, Fiona. So, I mean, we don't have much more time and it's been a fascinating discussion. I think we probably all can talk about this for quite a lengthy period of time because we come from different components of practice. And it's while it's a topic, uh, you know, that has been raised in Ali's book, it, I think there's been a lot of worth in going back in time and then looking at the public sector, in particular in the education sector and raising the debates that are so important, but also giving some meaning. And uh, Ali, what I'd like to focus on, if you could, is perhaps uh, what could be your, you know, we say key takeaway. If you could share with us maybe one or two um, from your end that would be useful, then I'll come to Fiona and then we'll move towards wrap up. Um, look, I think I think the book covers uh, quite a bit of issues uh, that are important when it comes to strikes, and I think it covers a lot of those uh, debates on whether and uh, the arguments against strikes uh, uh, deal with strike violence, uh, uh, majoritarianism issues, uh, and, and those things. Um, I do think um, we see there's bigger issues. You know, the book deals with one small aspect of, of, of education, uh, 
and 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 and, uh, and and strikes in particular. And I do think we need to put more emphasis on trying to prevent strikes if we can. Uh, I do think uh, uh, as a country, probably we need to refocus on, on what's important uh, and, and, and get ourselves back on track. Uh, I do think that uh, if you look at the history of teacher strikes and if you look at the history of South Africa as a whole, it's communities that challenge the state, that keeps the state on track, whether it's teacher unions, whether it's student movements, whether it's a number of women movements, uh, whether it's... Um, so, so we've got a, whether it's we've got a history of all those those, those movements challenging the state, and I think South Africa is a unique uh, country in a sense that we have people who are able to uh, to come out of this uh, and 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 come out challenging uh, what uh, what's happening around us, and 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 we need to as a community do that. We need to keep the state on track uh, to 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 ensure that corruption is removed, uh, to ensure that there's uh, access to services to all in this country, to ensure that our electricity uh, works not only for certain communities, but for everybody. And I think technology is also important in education, uh, to have access to technology, to, to, to schools which don't have those access to technology. Um, it's not just the private schools uh, that, 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 you know, those are the, that, that I mean, those are our parents who normally have access to those things. I think we need to look at the facilities within these rural, rural schools uh, to ensure that every child has a right to a proper education, to ensure that schools are not uh, uh, places where, where, this, where children are such subjected to crime. Um, so my takeaway from this is that as a community, we need to keep the state accountable uh, and ensure that we provide the, for those rights uh, that uh, that we that that we we wanted in '94 uh, to get back on track to do that. Uh, that requires a work ethic uh, from all of us, and that requires all of us to be vigilant in ensuring uh, that there's access to to fundamental rights to all South Africans. Uh, and strikes or protests are an important part of that uh, in keeping the state on track. Uh, and we need to do that without violence. And we need to ensure that. Um, that we, we that we I suppose achieved the promise that we that we wanted in '94, and I think we can do that. But we just need to get those NGOs, communities, trade unions, collectively, uh, to keep the state accountable. Fantastic, thank you, Dr. Chikte. Okay. Fiona, um, yes. some key takeaways from your side, perhaps yes, in a minute. Sure. <laughs> I'd like to to put some emphasis on. Uh, incentives, share option schemes, because you're trying to drive a cooperation with 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 employees, and you want them to share in 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 the good times. Of course, that's the big challenge for the state. It just doesn't have quite the same uh, luxury, perhaps, as the private sector, but it needs to start getting creative as to how it can just beyond what would be your your basic wage as to how you improve the life of all. And I think it's a key takeaway going forward. Thank you very much. I mean, the public sector certainly is a very important sector. Mm -hmm. It emphasizes uh, and also guides the way in collective bargaining. And that responsibility is not, uh, I mean, I've been involved in some of the facilitation in the public sector, and I think there is a sense of responsibility amongst the parties themselves, and they certainly have a wider berth and wider spectrum of uh, engagements around a whole range of areas. I suppose when we think of the disputes that arise, we focus on uh, you know, just the percentage debates that exist. And it's interesting this year, I think Satu has already signed the agreement that's been proposed by uh, government and you have a few other unions that are dissatisfied for a whole range of reasons. But I think uh, if I take away something from what all you've said, I mean, you've gone uh, and it's the importance of understanding where the law comes from. The policy is not in isolation. It works together with a whole lot, a lot of other pieces. For me, there's an importance of responsibility. And I think the ILO's collective bargaining survey that they've just publicized a few months ago in 2022 have emphasized the importance of learning from the um, COVID period where there was a greater level of collaboration, the importance of what is a human-centered approach, because ultimately this is for the greater development of humanity, whether it's economic development, social justice, in effect, we're working together. 
But great, more important than that is the really a reflections on employers, employee organizations and trade unions. Are they self-organized to the extent that they can be credible players within the collective bargaining space? If not, they need to take some serious stock of what's going on internally. And the second is that are they capacitated enough in this really very fast paced change in world? The growth of trade unionism, I think, um, I'm seeing a report that's been issued by CDH this morning already is that uh, there's been some growth of management uh, membership amongst trade unions, but worldwide there's a decline. But there's a growth in newer areas, in areas where there is consultancy arrangements, more independent workers. And so what we're finding is that there is probably a need for a greater look in inwardly. Now, I know we're at 10 o'clock, but very quickly uh, at the end, CDH, thank you very much. And uh, Fiona, um, just from your side, and then I want to come in with Juta, where, where can we get the book as a final snippet? But from CDH side, if anyone needs some advice, um, clearly they can contact or advise us. What does CDH do? <laughs> and and we, we're there for our employers and, and would be clients, new clients. And and also to to seek out these challenges. I think that uh, the law is never static because issues in society are never static. So we need to to keep abreast of that. And I think that's one of our strengths is to assist our clients in staying on top of these legal developments. Thank you very much, uh, Ali. Where do we get the book? I'm sure there's someone from Juta here, yeah? or would you be able to advise us? Because this seems like something that is worthwhile as a read, but also for reflections. Yeah, I'm not sure if she's in. Um, uh, OK, but what we'll say is Juta is the publisher and on the flyer is uh, contact details. And I'm sure we can send that all on to participants that uh, would have attended. Uh, thank you very much to you, Dr. Chikta, for sharing your thoughts. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot more conversations on this. And lastly, as well, for WITS for allowing this to happen and congratulations on your 100 year anniversary. And for those behind the scenes like Karushka and others, thank you for setting this up. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.